was in her late teens where she was raped by nine, I believe it's nine police officers in Kingston, Jamaica. We may look different and live in different countries, yet our stories are knitted with the same threads of excitement, uncertainties, challenges, and victories. As we journey through the ups and downs of life, it is our undeniable will and God's strength that propel us to joy after pain, smile after frowns, and ups after downs. We were born to win. We were destined to greatness. We are overcomers. Welcome to God Scoops, Raw and Unedited Stories. Welcome to Raw and Unedited Stories on God Scoop, the place where stories are told to uplift, encourage, and to brighten your day. With us today is a man who hails all the way from Clarendon, Jamaica, with us to share his story. Welcome, Jason, to Raw and Unedited Stories. How are you? Thank you, Patricia, for having me. I am doing well. I'm fantastic. I'm very happy for this opportunity to be here with you today. Awesome. Awesome. Now, this, let us get straight into your story. But before we do that, I just want to thank our viewers for tuning in. And for those who have subscribed, thank you. And those who have not, now is the time to do so. Now, Jason, tell our audience, who are you? Who is Jason Mills? So my name is Jason Mills. I also go by the moniker J-Quest, which my most recent book was published under J-Quest. I was born in Kingston, Jamaica, in Tivoli Gardens um, in the 1980s. <laughs> I'm in my I'm 37 year old now. And um, my mother's side of family um, is from um, Tivoli Gardens. And my mother's name is Maxine Davis. Um, so I was born in that area. Uh, my family is from that area. And at the age of seven months old, my parents brought me to Sanguine de Clarendon, which is where I was brought up. So I was raised in the country area in Sanguine from seven months old, did elementary school um, there. And that's where my grandmother came in the picture and the book Love Conquers All because she was the one who accepted me into her home at seven months old and raised me as her own child. Love Conquers All. That's the title of your book. Now, what was the driving factor that caused you to write such a book? Well, you know, my grandmother is very special to me. Um, we shared a very special bond which was cemented in our faith in Christ in church. I think what made our relationship special was the spiritual element. And so she passed away two years ago, February 11th, makes two years since she passed. And a um, few, several months after she passed away, the Holy Spirit said that I should write a book to honor her life. Though I didn't, wasn't up to writing any books because I actually was finished with writing books. I published three books then and the book thing is just too much work. <laughs> And yeah. so I said, I'm not going to write any more books, but the Holy Spirit said, you have to write this one. <laughs> and so I decided to write this book to honor her life and her legacy. Awesome. Awesome. So your grandmother is the main factor for writing this book. Love conquers all. Now, talk to us about your childhood with your grandmother and even before. Um, you know, with my grandmother, um, she always saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself um, because you know usually in, the, in those days and age the kind of people from that area uh, didn't really kind of take to the Kingstonians you know especially the ghetto areas like Tivoli Gardens for instance so there was a stigma attached to me just coming from that area which affected me throughout my childhood and even to this day um, I was trying to explain that to my brother who's from the area even recently that you know, it wasn't easy growing up in a country area, having the stigma over your head that you're from a garrison. But my grandmother saw something in me that saw a seed in me. She saw something in me that she believed was worth investing in. And so she did her best to invest in me, though she had many kids of her own. My grandmother had, I think, I think she had 11 children. And at the time, probably around four or five of them were still in the household and other people. And she still took in the seven-month-old baby um, from a 19-year-old and from Tivoli Gardens and welcoming her home. And, you know, 
but she just spends so much time cultivating a relationship. And um, she she just kind of looked at me as like a special child. I don't know why. Um, in church, she always have this special thing where she and Jason, if you see Miss Dell, you see Jason, if you see Jason, you see Miss Dell. I mean, even a book that we had for the church, you know, her name and my name is in the book. So it was just something special in that circle, you know, that we just bonded um, immediately from, from that early age until I, I grew up as an adult and still have that strong bond with her. Awesome, awesome. The mother was, your grandmother was your driving factor um, for your motivation, right? So at the time, what happened to mom? Did she just decide to leave you with grandma or just that's the culture at the time? Well, no, you know, um, my mother, unfortunately, she suffered a traumatic incident, um, a rape incident um, prior to my birth. Um, I think she was in her late teens where she was raped by nine, I believe it's nine police officers in Kingston, Jamaica. A lot of people don't know that side of my story or even her story. And this is actually the first time I'm publicly saying this. I've been written books and mentioning the incident, but I've never specifically said what the incident was. Well, now that, that now I think I'm at this place in my life where I would be more open about that. It was a rape incident. Um, you know, she I think she probably was 17, 18 years old. Um, and it ruined her life. It ruined her entire life. It ruined her entire life. She passed away in 2017, by the way, at 51 years old. Um, so um, the, as a result of the rape incident, it brought on the onset of mental illness. Mm -hmm. And so she was not capable of raising me. She mm -hmm. wanted to. She mm -hmm. wanted to, but she just wasn't capable mentally, emotionally to raise me as her own. And incidentally, and I wrote about this in the book of Conquers All, she came back for me. Because when she when they brought me to Clarendon, to Sangunity, her intention was for me to visit, not to live. Mm -hmm. So she came back for me, you know. And it, it so happened that it was on a Sunday she came back for me. She was a, she's a Sabbath keeper, so she go to church on Saturday. But my grandmother and I, we went to Anglican church, so we went to church on Sunday. And so my mother and some other folks came back, came back to Sangunati for me. And incidentally, my grandmother was bringing me from church. And it's because they saw that I was coming from church while they left me there. So had, had, it, had it been, been on any other day, the story could have been different. Right, right. Or if they saw any, you know, ill treatment towards me, they probably would, would have taken me. But because my grandmother was bringing me from church, my uh, my mother and the people them said, "No, Maxine, man, he mean in good hands, he mean good hands." And by the way, this is probably twenty year old, twenty one year old Maxine. This is a very young, you know, young person, mm -hmm. and so that's what made her decide to leave me down in Sangonetti. All right. So, your because your book is a real story, it's a true story. Talk to us about some of the the, the um. The details of the book yes so the book the book is based on my relationship with my grandmother um the bond we shared the chemistry we shared and the fact that even though um i may have you know my my maternal lineage may come from an environment that was not so you know not so acceptable um to, to many she welcomed me in her home and welcomed me in her heart space which is more important and raise me as our own you know there's something special when somebody accepts you and and you feel a sense of belonging that's what i felt with my grandmother because not everybody accepted me some mm -hmm. rejected me you know it may not have been a vocal rejection by some though mm -hmm. it was by some but my grandmother made it very clear that i was accepted affirmed valued loved cherished you know and so those were the seeds that helped me blossom as I grew, in spite of the childhood traumas and other issues I dealt with, because I just felt in my heart that my grandmother loves me. I even wrote a song called My Granny Loves Me, which is on you, by the way. I wrote a song called My Granny Loves Me. And because that's what I felt, it was that love from her that kept me anchored throughout my life's journey. Awesome. And I just want to apologize um, to you for what happened to your mother. I know that was must have been devastating. And I know it must have impacted you as you grew up. Talk to us about that as well. And how did your grandmother intervene to kind of shelter or cushion that pain? 
Uh, well, you know, um, when I learned about my mother's um, illness, because I didn't know about the rape situation when I was younger, but I knew about the mental illness. I didn't understand it. I didn't know what was going on because a lot of persons didn't want me to know. Um, they didn't want me to know the story, my story so young. And I understand why. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just confused because I didn't have a place in my heart of feeling like, okay, I'm connected to somebody in a way that could never be separated. Because mm -hmm. that's what you have with a mother. No matter what, a mother can never um, disown you. A father may, a mother mm -hmm. can't. And so I would see other young people, including people in my family, younger person in my family, had their mothers. And I would say to myself, how in God's name, I don't have a mother. <laughs> what yeah, happened? Yeah. You know, um, and, and, and the other thing too is that she's far away. She's in Kingston and, you know, we didn't have social media back then, of course, as you know. So it wasn't a situation where we spoke regularly. I hardly spoke to her. Sometimes she come and spend time with me. Sometimes I went to Tivoli, but it wasn't a regular thing. It's not like she lived up the road. You understand? So mm -hmm. there was this void in my heart of mm -hmm. why, 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 why don't I have my mother? But my grandmother, because she was just so vested in me and she was just so nurturing, I wrote in the book that my grandmother, my grandmother is like um, what water is to a plant. You know how water nurtures a plant? That's how she was with me. And we have this kind of bond where I trusted her. Anything she told me to do, I did it. Mm -hmm. If we're cleaning the four cub, I'm doing it as if it's something joyful as a kid, which is something mm -hmm. that most kids would not want to do because grandma told me to do it. So it's that kind of bond, you know, she's, she, if she's peeling ginger outside, I'm there peeling ginger with her. If she had martyr, um, coffee, I'm martyring coffee with her. So we had that kind of relationship where whatever she did, I was just there with her. And so that nurturing spirit kind of helped sh shelter my heart, my soul, if you will, mm -hmm. from, from not sinking into deep depression and, and, you know, at that tender age. Awesome. Awesome. And I've heard so many stories like yours where grandparents just kind of um, chip in where parents could not. And this is a phenomenal story indeed, Jason. Talk to us about how you overcame some of those uh, just sideline struggles because uh, grandma was there for you. So you, you never had it in, in, in your, in, you, know, you never, you didn't see it right away every day, but Indeed, it was there. So how did you overcome that? Well, you know, one of the biggest struggles I had growing up, and even to this day as a grown man, I still struggle with this. I still get therapy for this, is dealing with rejection. Because as I said, even though my grandmother accepted me and affirmed me, not everybody did. And, um, you know, so I, I struggle with what I refer to as the nobody syndrome, the feeling of nobody, the feeling of not belonging, you know? that sense of not having a home base, you know, like this is home. This is where mm -hmm. I come from. You know, I struggled with that growing up, even though my grandmother's love was always there for me and all of that, I still had this struggle in me internally, etern internally that says you're nobody because look, you don't have no parents, you know, because growing up, my outlook was, my outlook in my, in my ecosystem at the time, my environment at the time was that everybody had a family and you're identified based on the family you have so mm -hmm. if so the respect you get as a child when i was growing up was dependent on who you're connected with so if mm -hmm. your mother respected in the community and your family is respected you get the respect i don't know if it's still the same in jamaican culture but that's mm -hmm. how it was when i was growing up yeah. so if daddy and mommy respected you get the respect now if your mother come from tivoli gardens and you know see no father then you're not chances are you're not going to get any respect because mm -hmm. in your mind, you know, you're a nobody. And I had to struggle with that. And it's not going to be overt, you know, sometimes. It's not going to be just blatant, you know. But as a kid, you're sensitive and you're just sensitive because you see the interaction with other children and how people deal with you. And so I struggled with that, that feeling of, of nobody. And I think what helped me to overcome it was the love of my grandmother in addition to knowing my identity in Christ. And mm -hmm. I kept telling people that, um, to this day, I wrote it in my books from in my early 20s, and I'm still hammering the same point. To me, one of the most important things as a Christian is to understand your identity in Christ. It is crucial because mm -hmm. identity has to do with who you are. And if you don't see yourself as being um, in Christ and being connected to him and seeing yourself as a child of God, 
it's going to impact how you see yourself and how you operate in the world. Yes, absolutely. Because the scripture talks about when mother and father forsake you, I will take you up. Amen. Yeah, and uh, that I'm sure is a, that's your testimony, right? Your 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 testimony that the Lord has been your father, your mother, and everything, even when um, grandma couldn't even touch those deep hurts, right? Um, thank you for that, um, Jason. And I'm sure there are so many other young people who experience just the same journey that you experienced. Just mm -hmm. use this time to talk to them about how to overcome some of these issues. And, and then you can just talk to us about where you are now in your life and how you got there. Yeah, I would suggest, especially to younger people um, with all these myriad challenges they're facing, that the way to overcome these things is to know who your identity is and to know who you are and to have a place of being, to be at a place where you're anchored. I think being anchored is very critical because a lot of time throughout my journey, even when I was in school and I, you know, failed a course, my first um, paper in college, for instance, in undergraduate school, I got, an, I got a D minus. And I went to my, my um, counselor and said, this college thing is not for me. And so I went to the Lord and I prayed about it and the Lord helped me to get the best grade in the class. So what I think helped me is just understanding who I am in Christ. And because I believed who I am in Christ, I believed I had the strength, the tenacity, the resilience to get to overcome the obstacle. You, okay. you know what I'm saying to you? Because no matter what the challenge is, if it's a challenge of writing a book, if it's a challenge of when I was in the military, even today I wasn't feeling like talking. But whatever the challenge is, I just believed the belief is in Christ and my identity in him. And for some reason, I get this in supernatural strength and here I am talking to you or, or, or I end up writing the book or I end up getting through college and, and doing it with honors. So what I want young people to understand is the benefit of being of having your identity in Christ and being anchored in your faith. There's a benefit to it. You, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying to you? Because strength is derived from it. Mm -hmm. You can get enriched from it. Thank you. I want you to talk to us a little bit more specifically about having an identity in Christ as a young person. Yes, um, I know in the, today's culture where the church culture is heavily focused on the prosperity gospel, a lot of this, this isn't a common um, theme, unfortunately, in a lot of um, um, Christian circles, which is very unfortunate. But, but when you even look at scriptures carefully, um, when Paul, um, especially from the epistles from Paul, he talked about, he talked a lot about having your identity in Christ. Because when you see yourself, you know, remember, we all have a self image. You all, we all see ourselves in a certain light, in a certain way, right? Um, whether it's me being a black male, black Jamaican male from Clarendon country, you know, so you see, you have this identity thing on many levels. But when you look beyond all of the, those layers and you say, but wait, I am a child of the most high God. And if God wants me to do something or to accomplish something, what can stop me? Because think about it. If the most high God and there isn't anybody higher than him is on your side, then who can overcome you? What can stop you? You know what I'm yeah. saying? If Christ is for you, then who can be against you? Think about it logically. Mm -hmm. If you have the, the highest power or force in the universe on your side, then you must win one way or the other. You're going to overcome. It may not happen how you want it to, when you want it to, but God is going to make, make a way. And that's what usually happens in my life. He just always make a way. And it's oftentimes in ways that I don't expect it. Mm -hmm. Because that's where the faith comes in, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I want young people to understand is that, you know, there is really a benefit to being connected with a power that is higher than you. Think about this in a practical sense. If we were connected to the president of the United States, right, who is probably the most the most powerful office in this country, you're going to have a certain level of benefit by being connected to this person, right? Mm -hmm. Now, imagine the most high God. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, yes. So it doesn't matter what you feel, what the struggle is, what the trauma is. You may feel it. You may go through it. But that supernatural enablement, that grace, that favor, is going to empower you. Amen. The most high God the maker of the universe. Now, when I read a storybook, I always wonder what became of the protagonist? What became of Jason Mills? 
Well, you know, um, in terms of my life, you know, I, I seldom you like to talk about where I'm at because I'm not the kind of t guy who likes to talk about um, accomplishments, but I, I'll just try to share some because you asked the question. Um, so where I'm at presently in my life is I'm a, I was able to um, um, earn my bachelor's degree. I was able to earn two master's degree, um, one in um, public policy and, um, and administration and the other in biblical studies and theology. And I was also able to um, to accomplish um, going through the United States um, Navy and um, working for the federal government now. And of course, publishing four books. So, so those are the things I was able to accomplish um, through the, the power and grace of God um, throughout my life. Amazing, amazing story, Jason. Thank God for you. Thank God for just journeying with you through those years. And if you, Jason Mills, can do it, many others can. So thank you. Before we close this session, just say one thing to our listeners, one thing. Yes, if there's one thing I would love your listeners to know is that um, there is value and benefit to trusting in God and understanding that he loves, he loves you. Because a lot of people out there, the reason why we don't accomplish and strive to to become all that we have created, God has created to, us to be is because we have this feeling of feeling unloved because we were created to receive love from God who is love. And so if you understand that in spite of what you face in your life, that you're approved by God and that you're anchored and tied to him, he will help you to accomplish any um, goals you have set for yourself in this life. So don't lose heart. Don't lose hope in spite of how dark it might be. There's always a beacon of light and hope when you're in Christ. Thank you, Jason Mills, for sharing with our audience on raw and unedited stories on God's Scoop. Thank you so much. And please repeat the title of your book. Yes, the name of my book, my recent book is Love Conquers All, an unbreakable bond between spiritual um, two, um, two generations. And it's available on amazon.com. Thank you. Love Conquers All. Thank you, Jason. Thank you to our audience for tuning in to Raw and Unedited Stories. Now, everybody has a story to share. If you have a story to share, send your information in the description link below and we will reach out to you. And remember, subscribe, like, and share. And thanks to those who have already subscribed. You have yourself a phenomenal day.